Welcome back. Our next session is titled Charts versus Calculators, Ways to Analyze a Stock. I will be one of the panelists in this session, and I will be handing the reins over to Frank Litke, Senior Director of Strategic Planning with Ally Invest. And we are honored to have Shana Sissel, the Chief Investment Officer at Spotlight Asset Group, as our guest speaker. Hello, Frank and Shana. Hi. Good afternoon, Brian. It's great to be with you guys here today. Thank you for inviting me. So, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to switch roles here and be the moderator for today's discussion. We're very fortunate to have a few people here that are gurus in their respective spaces. Brian Overby is one of our very own options and chart gurus here at Ally Invest. And we're very happy and honored to have Shana Sissel who is the Chief Investment Officer at Spotlight Asset Group here for our conversation. You know, going back through all the way to B school, I can remember one of the age old debates is technical versus fundamental analysis. And today we're gonna do it between charts and look at calculators and the ways that we can actually analyze a stock in the different methodologies. So I'll ask questions in an uh, Q and A style format and hand the ball back forth to Brian and Shana. So getting started here, and we've got some great visuals for you all as well. I'm going to get right into it. So Brian, the first one, we'll have you start here. What do you mean by charts? What is technicals 101? Take me through that. All right. So when we look at the chart, some people will refer to them as graphs, but you're basically just looking at the stock price movement. Uh, throughout any different time periods. And a lot of times with charting, a lot of people like to look at uh, what happens day in and day out as far as the time frame, And they'll go back as much as three months, six months, as far as a year to try to look for technical patterns within the chart, uh, things that you see that happen uh, throughout the entire industry um, that happen repeatedly, uh, repeatedly throughout the, the different stocks and the different underlying stocks. So. When people are looking at charting and trying to decide, should I buy or should I not buy? It has a lot to do just with patterns overall that they're seeing within the charts for that specific stock, or maybe for an index like the S&P 500 index or Russell 2000 or the NASDAQ in general. Very interesting. Okay, so I guess fundamentals and you know, looking at calculators. Shana, take me through what you mean by that and how it might contrast from what Brian's talking about. Well, first I wanna start by saying that fundamentals and technicals are not in competition with each other. They actually work together and they both have value when you're evaluating a potential investment. But fundamentals really comes down to the core belief that when you buy a stock, you're buying a fractional ownership in a company. Every stock represents a, a percentage ownership, obviously, and so, by buying a stock, you're becoming, in many ways, an owner of the company. So you should understand the business. Fundamentals is really focused on just that, understanding the underlying business, profitability, the cash flows, uh, you know, how much debt does a company have? You know, how much is it making? What is its cost and expenses, its liabilities, its assets? Understanding what that is and then coming down and using your calculator and models and there are a variety of different ways to do this in which you determine what the value of that fractional ownership that you have, that stock should be, i.e. the stock price. And in essence, that's exactly what you're doing. So while technicals tend to focus on shorter term time periods, three, six months to a year, uh, fundamental analysis is focuses on a longer term period, like the health of the business over time. Where is it today? Where is it going to be tomorrow? Where is it going to be a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? And that's really the focus of what fundamental analysis is all about. Great. So what I took away from that is that we don't need necessarily need to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. We can use them in conjunction, which is a great segue to our next point. And, and Brian, maybe kicking it back to you, how does your time frame work? i.e. how long are you looking out and does it affect fundamentals versus that technical view? Well, if I'm looking at a certain time period now, if you 
talk to a lot of technical analysis people. They'll say that the theories supposedly work in all different time periods. In other words, if I'm setting trend lines, if I'm looking at moving averages, whatever my choice of um, a technical analysis that I want to apply, that it should work on a, a day-long chart, a 15-minute chart. It should work on a three-month chart, looking at daily moves in and out overall. But in general, the most looked at charts are daily charts. Um, and when you're looking to set trend lines and you're looking to set uh, areas of support and resistance, a uh, lot of times you're going to look at whatever time frame that though that those charts are actually playing out. So, for example, if I see an area where we've bumped up on against resistance on a stock trying to break out uh, to, to to new highs, sometimes that time frame could be uh, two months out. Sometimes that that range where it's bumped up against it could be just simply the last two weeks where we've seen that that situation. So the time frame in general, the theories behind technical analysis apply to all different time frames, but it really matters a lot. Like where are you drawing your trend lines? Where, uh, uh, what type of moving average you're typing, uh, you're planning on using overall to decide the time frame that you want to look at in general on your chart. Interesting. And what's your view on it, Shana? Like how do you how do you think about time frame with fundamentals? Any other response there? Yeah. So with technicals, you know, as a fundamental uh, analyst, I, I tend to focus on technicals more as like entry and exit points. I think that's where they are most helpful. But when it comes to fundamentals, you're typically looking at longer periods of time, attempting to forecast business for a company uh, one to three to five years out. Um, it depends on the type of company we're looking at, but you can typically look at business trends and economic trends and get some feel for you know the forecast of the business over time. What are the key growth drivers? You know what is the company doing to improve its balance sheet, improve the business, improve its margins? All of these things are things you're going to look at. You're going to look at um, in many ways fundamental uh, analysis can include factors where you might be looking at history. So. You know, one of the things that we looked at, and I think we have a chart here that shows uh, valuation, like earnings valuation, price to earnings, and uh, here's earnings over an economic cycle. So the economy has cycles. You have early cycle, mid cycle, late cycle, recession, and it just sort of rotates through that over time. Uh, and there's no rhyme or reason to how long these periods last, but this is how the economy generally moves. And it's fairly um, easy to understand and somewhat predictable about what works in certain parts of the cycle and how those different parts of the cycle impact the business and the business earnings. So you can kind of see from this chart, um, you know, how earnings work throughout uh, the economic cycle. I think we have a, uh, the next chart shows earnings and valuations over time. So price to earnings ratio is one of the more common fundamental factors uh, that are used. It's simply taking the earnings of the company and dividing it. Um, 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 let me rephrase that, taking the price of the company and dividing it by the earnings of the company, the earnings per share. And then you're figuring out, you know, whether or not uh, the multiple of how, how, how much it is trading versus its earnings. You know, you hear it all the time, 10 times, 12 times, 20 times, 100 times uh, to get an idea if a stock is uh, trading at a discount to its long term history to the market. And these are things that can be helpful in determining whether or not a stock is attractive at a certain price. Uh, 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 price to earnings is one factor. We have price to um, book, we have price to sales. There are a number of different fundamental factors you can look at. Earnings per share growth is one of the big ones we look at when you're thinking about time. So earnings per share, you're going to look at the growth of the company and the potential ways the company can grow uh, its business, its profitability, and its earnings. And, and that is usually uh, the average fundamental analyst is going to try to predict that on a one, three, and five-year basis. And then as more information becomes available on a company's earnings calls, through its financials, you know, through just the economic cycle, they'll make changes to that in an attempt to predict what the actual value of that company is, you know, over time. Great. So assimilating it for our, for our audience, I heard you say PE and looking at that chart, it's almost like getting a retail item on sale or not, whether or not we 
believe, their fundamental analyst believes, something's a good price or a good value mm -hmm. through time. So that's, you know, that's a great point on, on the fundamental side of the house. Now, given that, given that information and knowing what Brian said about the technical side, I'm going to start with you, Shane, on here. How do you decide when to buy? Looking at this chart here, you're using fundamentals and starting to get into the technical side of things and looking at some corollary factors between recession period, the forward PE ratio. How do you decide as a fundamental analysis um, expert, how do you, how do you, when are you, you going to buy? When are you going to jump in to the market? So typically, it, it really is basically do you think the stock is worth more than its current price? At the end of the day, that is when you decide to buy and you decide to sell when you think the stock is worth less than its current price. Now, where technicals can play a role here is that, well, a stock may be trading above what you think it's worth or below what you think it's worth. Oftentimes, things like human behavior impact how a stock will trade in short term periods of time. So that's where technicals come in. You're going to look at momentum. You're going to look at um, moving averages and you're going to see, is there any specific technical factor that is playing against me at this moment or in a uh, flip side uh, that is you know, favorable for me? Maybe I think my stock is incredibly overvalued, but it has hugely positive momentum or it's broken a bunch of very favorable technical factors. Maybe I don't sell right away. I know the stock isn't worth what it's trading at, but I don't want to lose any potential upside, additional upside opportunity because the technicals are favorable. So I'm actually going to look at technicals where they're at extremes when I'm making buy and sell decisions. If I want to buy a stock or sell a stock and the technicals uh, support or don't support that decision on an extreme basis, then I might make a... Uh, and then I might hold off on on pulling the trigger one way or the other. Brian, when do you decide? You know, given her her comments, when do you decide to to jump in? Anything different there? Do you do you agree? How do you feel about it? Well, if I look at um, on the on the slides that that we have prepared, we talked a little bit about a small cap earnings situation versus the overall marketplace and and how the small caps out of the recession, or I should say out of the downturn that was caused by the pandemic, how they led us in some ways to new highs in a lot of different marketplaces overall. And there are some times when you can look at, well, here's what the fundamentals are saying. And then also we can see situations where the technicals go along with the fundamentals. Now, there are also times where there is no fundamentals in general on a specific stock uh, and we've seen that a lot. We just had a conversation about the meme stocks in the last session where the drivers of the price really had nothing to do with the actual fundamentals overall. But then we've had a lot of uh, NASDAQ stocks that were leading the way out of uh, our recession after that pandemic overall. And a lot of them just had really strong fundamentals and that were driving us forward. So I like, I, I agree with, with uh, Shana in that a lot of times you can look at technical and fundamental to help make your, your buy decision and your sell decision on the underlying stock. Now, if you're investing for the long term, you can still use this to try to use technical analysis to try to pick that price point that you wouldn't mind starting your longer term investment. And then maybe use some things like moving averages in that to determine, well, the market is turning down and uh, now it would be a time when I would like to get out. So I have a few examples of that on some of the charts, but before we get into it, I wanna pass it back to Shana to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what happened with the small caps uh, as we came out of the big downturn in the market last March. So this is a perfect example of a period of time where both the fundamentals and the technicals were uh, suggesting that there was a potential for a breakout uh, or a significant change in the behavior of the small caps in general. Now, sometimes the fundamentals you look at are counterintuitive. This happened here, and this tends to happen. One of the areas that people get a little confused about when they look at fundamentals is cyclical stocks like energy and materials, where the fundamentals actually behave completely the opposite of what you would expect right before uh, they're, they're headed for a breakout. So let's look at this small cap chart that we have here. Um, what you see here is that right around uh, October, 
uh, two things happen in small cap fundamentals uh, that were worth looking at. And then the technicals, and Brian will get into that, we'll kind of walk you through how the technicals supported this. Two things happened. The first thing that happened is that we hit a historic high in non-earners in the S uh, in the Russell 2000 index, meaning that a higher percentage of stocks in the uh, Russell 2000 were not earning any sort of profit uh, at, at that period of time. Historically, that that's actually a positive. Uh, you know, usually you hit uh, the maximum number and then that starts to come down. That was paired with a period of time where, again, it's the fundamental uh, aspect of it, where more companies in the Russell 2000, uh, I think it was 70 percent at the time, were putting out positive guidance of earnings growth. So there was a, a large majority of the companies and the Russell 2000 were telling you that they're going to have better earnings than was previously expected. And at the same time, the number of companies who didn't have earnings at all had peaked. So those two things in conjunction were fundamental signals that small caps could be ready to break out. And I'll let Brian kind of explain the technical things that supported that as well. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's just to look at that chart, we see the little bit of the breakout that we saw in the small caps break away from the from the large caps. So I'm going to stop the slideshow right here, and I'm going to continue on by just looking at some actual charts that we have uh, inside the Ally Invest live trading platform. So I'm sharing my screen here, and I'm going to highlight, first of all, in the IWM. We saw this in the chart that we basically made up inside our PowerPoint slides. But this was the area that, that Shana was kind of talking about here in that we saw uh, in the IWM, which is basically the Russell 2000 index, it's the ETF that tracks it. We saw this one area where we bumped up against that resistance uh, to the upside a couple of times. And at this moment in time, the S&P 500 index was outperforming and kind of leading the way. And specifically, we really saw the NASDAQ stocks, uh, the FANG stocks in general, uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, 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 Apple, Netflix, Netflix. Netflix Google. and Google. Yep. Uh, those stocks in general were really leading the market higher. You could throw in a couple others. You can throw in Microsoft and a, a couple of new ones like Zoom in the NASDAQ were leading the way out of the pandemic. Well, this is right where that situation occurred that Shana was talking about. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about how I drew that trend line. If I looked at this, I just see a couple of touch points here and I'm zooming in on this section and I'm actually trying to line up a horizontal line that will touch that. Now, a lot of times when I'm looking at the technical analysis of this, I will also zoom out and say, okay, that's an interesting point right there but let's zoom back a little bit in time and take a peek at this. And if you look all the way back to 2019, look at all the different times that we bumped up against that resistance line in the IWM or the Russell 2000 index, and we never quite could break through. But when we did, you saw a lot of good upside on that underlying. Now, obviously this is where we have the major news event that happens. And that also is gonna act as a point of resistance to the upside. But here's one great example where the earnings uh, in the small caps were starting to take off, starting to pick up a little bit, the PE ratios in general that uh, Shana was talking about. And then we also had a little bit of a breakout from this resistance area to the upside right uh, at the beginning of October. And now I also want to emphasize that this isn't always 100% correct. So we always have to talk about the good and the bad. We kind of had a false breakout here. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people in general in the technical analysis side that decided to get long right in this area only to have it break back down again. Now, one thing about technical analysis is the more times it bumps up against that resistance level, and the harder it is for the marketplace and other in, in general to just beat that, that underlying stock back down. And then eventually we had the big breakout to the upside. And this actually came that this gap opening that we see, interesting enough, is a, the 100% retracement level. Now, that's a Fibonacci term, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I want to pass it back to Shana to get a little, little bit of her comments on this overall. But when we saw that breakout to the upside, that was a very strong breakout point in the IWM. And 
overall, in hindsight, it's 2020 because we now see from the chart that it basically went parabolic to the upside. But then the IWM was definitely leading the way or the Russell 2000 index. And overall, that was a good thing for the markets. When you have the small caps leading the way uh, and, and actually beating some of the bigger cap indexes overall, that's usually a good sign for the, con the economy in general. I'll right, pass so that back to Shane and talk a little bit before about Before we that. pass it back to Shane, okay. you know, one of our, you know, our audience might be asking, you mentioned hindsight's 2020. We have this chart on the page. We can kind of see what happened. But as a technical analysis person, when do you decide to sell here? Using the tools that you have in real time, when do you decide to jump out from the technical analysis viewpoint? Well, that's a great question. Okay, so also on this chart, and I'm going to highlight a, a couple of things that I look at. I try to keep it real simple. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm not a chartered financial analyst. I'm, I'm an options trader that's traded options for a very long time. And when you're trading options, you have an expiration date. So a lot of times you're using a little bit more of the technical analysis than the fundamental analysis when you're actually picking your expirations and the option contracts that you're trading. But here's a, a couple of good things, especially or a couple of things that I like to look for in general in the marketplace overall and sometimes on just shorter term trades. I like to look at what's going on with the moving averages. And all my charts, I have, I just use the simple moving average. A simple moving average means that you're taking a certain period of time and you're making a weighted mathematical moving average based off of that, that many days inside the chart. So for example, we have on this chart here, the green line is a 20 day moving average. And then the red line is a 50-day moving average. And then the yellow line is a 200-day moving average. A lot of times, this is standard for a lot of charges to use these colors. Uh, I see a lot of time the 200-day moving average maybe being a blue line overall. But it's totally up to you to decide uh, that your choice there. But a lot of people in general, when they look at this, and I want to highlight this now that you brought this up, Frank, is the 200-day moving average is a little bit, uh, you know, it's a slower moving average because you're talking about 200 days. But a lot of people, especially closer to retirement, will use this to be like, when do I want to get in and when do I want to get out of the marketplace overall? And they like to look at it on indexes. And so we see in this area right here, when we broke through that 200-day moving average in the Russell 2000 index, when do I want to get back in? Let's say I decided if I break through that moving average, that means that we're obviously the marketplace is starting to turn over. It's moving slowly to the downside. This would be one area and one indicator where I might think, well, I want to lighten up on my portfolio in general because we broke through that 200-day moving average. And then you got to say to yourself, well, when do I want to get back in? Well, right here is a great time. When we finally broke up above that 200-day moving average, there was a lot of movement to the downside, a lot of movement to the upside. But this is some, in some ways where people on longer term investing paths that are investing in index funds might think about getting in and getting out of the market if they want to try to time it. That's where the moving averages can come in. And then obviously, if you're looking at a shorter time frame, you might be using those same type of moving averages to decide when you want to get out and get in. And I'll highlight that a little bit more uh, on a couple of the other charts that I want to share with you today. And I just want to point out, um, you know, how would a fundamental, somebody who's focused more on the fundamentals kind of look at this? You know, I'm not going to necessarily make my decisions based on the technicals, but in this case, there were a couple of fundamental uh, events that occurred that were favorable. And then if I were to say, look at the, the graph that we see here in October, uh, just before October is when you see the Russell uh, just very briefly fall below its 200 day moving average. And it was shortly after that, that uh, the fundamentals kind of peaked in a favorable way. And you'll see that even though it does break some resistance levels on the moving averages, the shorter term ones, it never breaks the 200 day again. Mm -hmm. So from a perspective of a longer term investor, I'm looking at, wow, there's some really favorable um, fundamentals here uh, that suggest to me that small caps could be uh, close to breaking out. And then if I look at the technicals, I see, well, we've had a couple of periods here where it's bumped up against a resistance level. 
Uh, and we've had some, uh, you know, movement on the downside a little bit, but it never broke its 200 day moving average again. So for me, that's a favorable sign that makes me think, OK, the fundamentals pair up with the technicals. And I feel really good about buying at this point. Got it. So that's a that's actually a great segue to the next question I have for you, Shane, is, you know, you mentioned the fundamentals and technical being in in cohort together makes you feel like it's a good time to get in. What happens? If they disagree, what if happens if they're disconnected? What's your play? It depends. So I'll give you a couple examples of um, how different types of investors might look at technicals in different ways. Um, moving averages uh, also kind of more broadly speaking, moving averages are what we use to, to think about momentum. And so in value investing, uh, value investors are looking to buy something cheap. And so a lot of value managers will use momentum uh, as a technical indicator on when not to sell. Uh, so sometimes they might think a stock looks expensive, but they might hold off on selling it at a specific time if the momentum factors, these moving averages, are favorable. Um, and so, you know, that is something some value managers have become more aware of. They also tend to stay away from stocks that maybe they look pretty cheap, but they have really negative momentum at the moment. Uh, I know there's uh, some managers out that, there that actually look at the momentum of a stock um, and they put them into quintiles and they just, no matter how cheap a stock looks, they won't buy anything in that fifth quintile. The rest of them, they don't care, but that fifth one, you stay away from. On the growth side, you might look at a stock that has no earnings, right? But you'll look at what's called earnings momentum, where you're looking at the gradual improvement of earnings, even if they're still negative. And once that starts to accelerate, then you want to buy the stock, even if fundamentally it may not look great in terms of the earnings or whatever on the surface. Uh, you're, you're going to look at that earnings momentum and then also potentially look at the momentum of the price of the stock. If those two things are working in tandem, that's usually a positive sign. And long term investors, though, you use technicals less about you know getting out of a stock or getting into a stock uh, that you already hold. Uh, it, it's more made to help you with the timing of a decision you've already basically made. So you've already decided the stock is too expensive. I want to sell it. Uh, I'm going to look at the technicals to see if the technicals support that and vice versa. When they break down, you don't worry about it if you're a long term investor, because as you can see, if you look at longer term technical charts, the technicals are short term indicators and they can turn very quickly. Um, you know, and so you might use, you know, technicals uh, when it makes sense to add to or, or maybe reduce a position. But if you think the fundamentals of a stock long term are positive, you're going to continue holding the name, uh, regardless of what the technicals say, because fundamental investors like myself believe that I own a company and I own the business. And all I really am focused on is whether or not owning that company makes sense and that the business is a, a profitable one, a growing business that has trends that are favorable. And the only time I'm gonna use technicals is if I've already decided I wanna buy or already decided I wanna sell. And then at that point, it will help me make better timing decisions. Great, that's that's very good. And I, so stylistically, it depends if you're into value or growth. Brian, what's your view on it? If, if fundamentals and technical disagree, how do you lean, how do you bifurcate that decision? Well, I kinda of wanna go, go back and just actually um, look a little bit more at that IWM and talk a little bit about, well, if the fundamentals are saying maybe we should sell, if I'm a longer term holder, maybe I just wanna stay in. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply that uh, over a technical analysis situation. And this had a lot to do with the slide deck that we were actually showing, where we were seeing the movements in the marketplace overall and in areas of recession, how long did it take for the market to get back to you know basically where it was before all the bad news hit the marketplace. And we see here, if you did apply the 200 day moving average to a specific index, and that doesn't really matter, if, uh, especially during the, the COVID period, if I look at the Russell 2000 index, if I look at the S&P or the NASDAQ, but if we got out when the 200 day moving average, when we breached it, and I mean, really breached it in that we had three or four days of, of situ, uh, uh, where we were trading below the 200 day moving average, this would be an area where I would think, well, maybe I need to get out. If I'm just applying this extremely simple uh, way of looking at the marketplace by using a 200-day moving average, keeping it simple. And I get back in right over here. Market goes up, I might get in there, stays up a couple of days, comes back down. But in this area, 
I decide, okay, now the market has made that turn up. So I want to jump back in. We're really kind of at the same place. In other words, uh, the person that held their own and stayed in might not might have had a lot more sleepless nights overall. But what those charts are kind of showing you is that technical analysis can can if you're using it to try to determine where I'm going to get in the marketplace overall and out of the marketplace, a lot of times the fundamental analysis that comes in and says, all right, I'm going to ride it through this storm. We saw by a lot of the charts inside that PowerPoint that a lot of times you end up in, in, in almost the same place overall. So that gets into short-term swings in general. And when we're talking about more shorter-term swings and more speculative trading, then the technical analysis and how you're going to draw your uh, trend lines and what you like to use overall uh, becomes more important. Great. So let's fast forward to today. We saw a little bit about where we were previously, how we use different tools and indicators to look at and evaluate the market. Shana, going back to you for a moment, what is your fundamental view on the current stock market and your outlook, or maybe just your view on the market today? So, I mean, the easy answer is that the market looks expensive. Um, and the way that you kind of look at that, my favorite basic fundamental view of whether a market is overvalued or undervalued is something called the rule of 20. It's super easy. It's so um, simple to do in just a basic Excel spreadsheet. And it's like back of the envelope, is the market expensive or not? You basically take the current PE of the S&P 500 and you add the inflation rate. And if it's more than 20, it's expensive. If it's less than 20, it's cheap. It's so simple. And it's, you know, and nothing's ever that simple, but, you know, it gives you a good idea. Uh, according to the rule of 20, the market looks expensive right now, the S&P 500. But then you have to look at what the key drivers of the S&P are and the weightings. And if you take out certain parts or you equal weight the S&P 500, it doesn't look so expensive. You also want to look at, you know, markets in extremes. You know, everybody talks about how the market is really expensive right now. Um, and because inflation ticked up the way it did, it definitely looks that way more so than it has in the past. However, again, you have to look at what's underlying. So as a fundamental analyst, I'm looking at broadly speaking, the market looks expensive. However, there are still pockets of the market where the fundamentals are very supportive. So for example, technology, a lot of people have kind of Poo pooed technology because it's done so well. It looks pretty expensive. But uh, one of my favorite portfolio managers used to say this Will Danoff from Fidelity. He runs the Fidelity Contra Fund. He used to say, PE is only as good as your E. And since E is based on a prediction of future earnings, you know, if you think the earnings are going to be better, then your PE is probably cheaper. So, um, you know, you have to take all of those things into consideration as a fundamental analyst. And that's, you know, the game, if you think about it. As a fundamental analyst, I'm trying to think, is the market correct in the assumptions it's making? And if I don't think it is, then I'm going to make a bet or vice versa. Uh, you know, that's that's how you uh, are thinking. And that's how you, quote unquote, win with fundamental analysis. You think the business is better than everybody else does. And so you buy it. Uh, or you think the business is worth more than everybody else does. So you want to invest in it. Sure. And so ultimately, you know, right now, does the market look expensive? Yes. But I think underlying it's because the earnings expectations that we all look at, those consensus ex um, estimates, which is a bunch of Wall Street analysts and what they think earnings are going to be uh, kind of averaged out. or uh, and, and so you look at that and you think, well, are they right? You have to keep in mind, yeah. and I know the previous session was on behavioral finance, Analysts tend to underestimate earnings because it is way better to be wrong that way than the other way. And so you have to think from a job security standpoint and just wanting to not be wrong in the least favorable way, you're always going to be a little conservative in your estimates. And that's why we've seen for the last several quarters, more companies in the S&P 500 significantly uh, beating their earnings. I think in this last quarter, something like 78% of all the S&P 500 companies beat their earning estimates by an average of roughly 20%. So if that's the case, 
then looking at the PE based on the consensus estimates is not the best way to value the market. So I actually think the market's probably fairly valued and that there's opportunities from a fundamental perspective uh, to make good investments even where we are today. Interesting, that's that's great insight. And we'll think about that rule of 20 as we go forward and ask Brian a similar question. Where do you think and what's your current technical view on the market? Well, uh, if I just look at the market in general and we look at the 200 day moving average, I'm just gonna keep it simple because my form of technical analysis overall is to not get too complex. Uh, like to look at moving averages. I like to draw trend lines in general. And then every once in a while, get a little fancy with a Fibonacci and a Fibonacci retracement, which is really just looking at, well, after a big downturn, uh, what happens when we take back half of that downturn? That's usually a good sign overall. But if I'm showing my chart once again, and I'm talking about just the market in general and the S&P 500 index, this goes a little bit to what uh, Shana is saying in that uh, we compare it to the 200 day moving average and we see that we're about 10% above where that average is at. We've kind of slowed down in the marketplace a little bit, but right now, according to the moving average and the momentum of the market in general, we're just a little bit inflated. And sometimes that makes it hard to invest. If we look at the NASDAQ index, which I'm gonna bring up, uh, up next, that's the NDX, we see a very similar pattern overall. But one of the things that is driving the NASDAQ, which is once again, looking at a trend line, which I have drawn right across the top is, uh, it was a laggard in the marketplace. We saw the S&P 500 index doing a little better than the NASDAQ. And we see that right here going uh, into May, into June. Now we see the NASDAQ leading the way once again. And technically, the NASDAQ looks a lot better than the S&P 500 index because we have this little breakout and we're setting new highs in the NASDAQ right now. And we're seeing a lot of those FANG stocks that we mentioned now uh, leading the way in the marketplace as opposed to being laggards overall. So are we overextended? If we look at the 200 day moving average, does the technical say that we're overextended? Not necessarily. It means that we are getting a little frothy in the marketplace. We have some decent momentum, but then it comes right back to the fundamentals. So in this instance, I would lean more on the fundamentals of what's going on in the marketplace, their earnings reports, the fact that a lot of the companies have been beating earnings reports overall. And one thing to, to kind of emphasize with what Shana was talking about, this is why a lot of analysts don't want to say, uh, put sell recommendations on stocks, right? Uh, what ultimately, when an analyst comes out and says that I'm going to change my forecast from a buy to a hold, a lot of times that means that the stock is going down. Why? Because holds are really sells, because they just don't really want to say that. And it's easier to forecast less as opposed to more. And so that goes hand in hand with what Shana was talking about overall. Great. So I heard the rule of 20. We learned a little bit about Fibonacci and the 200 day moving <laughs> average and We've had a lot of indicators that we've learned today. As we wrap for the final two minutes before we get into Q&A, are there any stocks, ETFs, or any different areas of the market that are better candidates for technical analysis versus fundamental? Maybe a minute each on, and starting with you, Shana, on, on if there's anything that you've noticed in your experience that's more of a ideal candidate for technical versus fundamental. Um, I tend to think growth stocks and stocks that are um, focused more on growing their earnings um, tend to be better from a fundamental standpoint or from a technical standpoint. Um, stocks that have no earnings, stocks that don't have any clear fundamentals to work with. If the stock doesn't have earnings, you don't have a price to earnings ratio to work with. If they, you don't have a peg ratio to work with, peg is price to earnings divided by growth. Um, and, and so, you know, those are the names, these meme names uh, that are so popular right now where technical analysis works better. Fundamental sure. analysis works better with solid businesses that have profitability, that have you know, somewhat predictable business models. Um, and so early stage growth oriented uh, stocks tend to more favorably incline themselves to the technicals and more mature companies with established businesses that have established profitability and earnings uh, where you can better understand the overall business uh, and where that business is going are tend to be more favorable from the fundamental perspective. That's a great answer. Actually, that was, you know, it's a good segue into Q&A because 
one of the very first, first questions we got from Michael was, is it more important to learn how to evaluate a stock via fundamentals or technical? And you just went and covered a lot of that. Depending on the stage of the company and where that equity is at, one could be better than the other if there's earnings present or otherwise. Brian, as we move into that, any other comments on that question? Yes, I do. And I just thought of a great example when Shana was talking. It actually just kind of popped in my head. But, uh, you know, we had a company that really didn't have that didn't have earnings that uh, really benefited from the pandemic. And that was Zoom. And they were they, they found their niche, their company uh, skyrocketed as far as the price is concerned. And then we have another old hat that also was in that same space, but not thought of quite as uh, a brand uh, as a, a leader in that space. And that was Microsoft. They both had competing products. Microsoft has Teams, Zoom has their Zoom platform overall. But what we saw was uh, the technicals probably played a little bit bigger role in Zoom's move to the upside or how you were going to value that company trying to pick uh, a buy point and a sell point. Whereas after we came out of, we got on the other side of the pandemic and we're, we're still kind of battling it right now, but we obviously things are looking up overall. We've seen Zoom actually get beat up to the downside because the actual fundamentals, the actual earnings aren't there, where Microsoft has actually excelled. It's actually been one of the NASDAQ leader stocks um, in the most recent times, even over the last month or so, that has kind of held its own. And a lot of it has to do with it being such a strong fundamental company. So uh, with Michael's question in general, which was the first one to, to come up with, is... Uh, I, there, there really is no good answer to that. And I'm not trying to evade the question. It really has to do a lot with what underlying you're looking at, how you are approaching the marketplace in general. Am I looking to try to speculate a little bit more? Am I going to be a swing trader in the marketplace? Or am I going to be doing that buy and hold situation where I really want to just fund, buy, find a very fundamentally sound company, pick a buy point, and then plan on holding it for the next few, uh, five, maybe even 10 years in time. So it's all about the way that you want to approach the marketplace. But I just gave you a great example of two different stocks that I would approach, my, if I were to be trading in those underlyings, that I would approach each of these stocks much differently because of what's going, around, going on in the background of the company. Great. Our next question comes from Akeem. Is there a way to cover how to calculate the margin of safety and intrinsic price for a company. Yes, I, I can jump right in there. So um, value managers talk about intrinsic value all the time. Um, and what they're basically saying is if, in most cases, this is not all the time, but I would say 99% of the time, you wanna calculate the value of the parts of the company, like how much would each part of the company sell for? How much would um, a buyer, somebody who might want to acquire the company, be willing to pay for the parts? Um, and then that really does, that's called your margin of safety. So in some cases, like in some areas that people would consider speculative, like micro caps, you can look at something like they have more cash on their balance sheet than the value of the stock. That's your margin of safety. You can look at a company that maybe owns a lot of real estate and value the real estate and say, well, the real estate is worth, I'm just gonna throw some numbers out there. The real estate's worth $90 million and the stock total is trading as if it's only worth $50 million. And so you could say the margin of safety is if something happened and that company went bankrupt, they could sell all their real estate for $90 million and you would know that that company is worth more and could, could handle that. You're, what you're trying to determine is, What's the floor value of the company, like the value of its assets? And that can mean things like intellectual property rights. That can be, you know, real estate. That could be, uh, you know, the, the value of the desks and chairs in an office building. And that's typically what's considered intrinsic value or margin of safety. You want to look at the value of the business today. And is it worth more than, you know, those tangible assets uh, today? Uh, and that would be, you know, your downside number. But there's so many different ways you can price a stock. There's something called the dividend discount model and something called the discounted cash flow model. Depending on the type of business, you might use something else. But when you're looking at intrinsic value, I always think about it as what would somebody come and want to pay for the business? Uh, and that would be the floor value of the company. Got it. 
So we'll get our next question from Michael. And he asks, is it smart to specialize or focus on one industry sector when a new investor, like airline and travel industry, for one example? Um, Dana? I'll take this one. Um, I think sometimes one, it's helpful to have areas of expertise. Um, you know, Peter Lynch always used to say, buy what you know. Um, and Peter and, and um, Will Danoff were famous for like on their lunch break, walking into downtown crossing and walking into, you know, average retail stores, restaurants and asking questions about the business. Like, what do people like? Um, and I do think that when it comes to investing, um, buying what you understand and what you know is really important because you're less likely to miss something or to not understand the impact of something on the company's business. So I think when you are starting off, having an area that you kind of focus on and you learn the basics of that industry business model, then it's easier to compare what's a good company in that industry versus what's not a good company. But I always feel like the best businesses to invest in are things that you would use yourself. That's always the best place to start. And that that was the basis for how Peter Lynch invests, invested the Magellan Fund. And that's what he, he wrote his books about was buy what you know. And so that that's good advice for any new investor. Right. Makes sense. I could see that. Brian, do you have any other comments? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, One of the things, you know, a lot of people talk about diversity. If you're just in one underlying industry, you're going to, uh, you have a lot of risk that's involved with that one industry. So by diversifying your portfolio via either just buying an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund that covers a lot of the marketplace or doing it individually. Inside the Ally community, uh, ally.com slash do it right, we actually have an, an article that we recently posted on just diversifying your portfolio and talking about how you stay diversify within that portfolio overall. So invest in what you know, and usually you want to diversify across uh, more than one industry. Uh, you don't want to get too crazy with it. I don't think that you should diversify into 20 different industries or 20 different companies overall, because that's a lot to manage. So keep it in a manage- manageable uh, a, a manageable format in general. Find industries that you think are doing well. Uh, recently, we've kind of had a upturn. The chip stocks are doing well. The healthcare stocks are doing well. Uh, the banking stocks and the, uh, were, were doing extremely well until just recently when the Fed came up and now the banking stocks aren't leading the market anymore. So you want to be diversified overall within industries or within general companies when you're uh, taking your investment approach. And just to jump on what Brian just said, uh, as a quote unquote professional investor, uh, and I hesitate to call myself that, but you know, essentially that, that's what most people would consider me. Um, we have a general rule of thumb. You know, I manage portfolios and I sort of buy what I know. Uh, and then where I don't have expertise, I hire someone who does. Uh, so that gets back to the mutual fund ETF. If I know that I don't have expertise everywhere, I want to find somebody who I feel really confident does and or has the support of people with expertise. So, you know, large fund companies have a portfolio manager who runs a portfolio, but those portfolio managers have analysts that have specific expertise that support them. So that's why I can say, you know, definitively, you know, having some sort of basis for diversification, whether it be a low cost ETF or a mutual fund where you just really like the portfolio manager and think they're a great investor, and then using that as sort of your foundation in which you can start to, you know, take the time to get to know companies and start buying individual names on your own. Excellent. We've got quick time for one more quick question. And this probably will be for Shana. It comes from David. Can you shed some wisdom on how you actually define what a value stock is using fundamental analysis? Or what are some of the indicators that that you use to define a value stock? So it's really important to know that value is not a universal definition. There's different types of value. So I'll start out with the two most basic types of value. There's what are called absolute traditional value names. This is when you calculate the intrinsic value of a company based on you know, its assets and you know, that type of thing, its cash flows. And you calculate that and you see, like, like I was the example I gave where the company had more cash on its balance sheet than it was the stock price was in, uh, trading at. That is absolute value. That means that the stock is clearly worth more than its current price. 
And then there's something called relative value, where you're looking at a stock versus its history. And you're going to look at, say, price to earnings and say it's trading at a discount to its historical price to earnings, or it's trading at a discount to its industry peers or the S&P 500. And so value can be defined a couple of different ways, but those are the two most basic, which is absolute value, which is your traditional Graham and Dodd kind of value approach, what Warren Buffett does. And then you have what's called relative value, which is you're looking at a stock versus the history of itself, its industry and the market as a whole and saying, well, it should be trading in line with these other factors. And so I think it is trading at a discount today, uh, but maybe it's not an absolute uh, value name. So there's those are the two primary ways that people approach value. Very insightful. And thank you for that response. And want to wrap up this session here today. I think it was a, a great session between technical and fundamental analysis. I want to thank you again, Shana, for joining us today and being part of our panel. And for you, Brian, the, the great insights that we heard from you over the past hour. So I'll hand it back over to you, Brian, to talk about what's up next in our digital conference. Yes, thanks, Frank, for moderating uh, this event and allowing me to be one of the panelists. And up next, we have the role of crypto and in investing. We'll start this session after a short five-minute break.